So, yeah, when you come into the session, you want to be sitting near people because there's going to be some interactions with people. Um, you won't have to touch them or anything, but, so don't worry about that. But you want to be sitting near people if you can. It's probably a good idea. Yeah, or, or people can come in and you can beckon them to you, you know, that kind of thing. But you want to be sitting near some people. Because the idea is you might interact with them a little bit. Yeah, so those of you coming in, try to sit near people because we're going to do some interactions in this session, even though it's short. Okay, so sit near people if you can. Okay, only two minutes till start time. Isn't it always awkward at the beginning and there's no sound, there's no music to white noise to talk behind and we're all kind of looking at each other? All right, those of you that are coming in, you want to sit near people if you can. It's a good idea to sit near people, like, you know, not right next to them, you know, but kind of near them. All right, one minute till showtime here. Here we go. Four hundred seats. It feels like a ghost town when there's only sixty people here, right? Okay. All right, here we go. We're going to get started now. So, my name is Daniel Mezik. Uh, I'm honored to be with you today. Um, I'm here to deliver as much useful content as I possibly can, um, building on what, what you've already learned today from the, the plenaries. So, like I said before, I have 10 years experience coaching. I've written a couple books. I'm writing a third book. Um, I'm considered somewhat of a heretic in the Agile community because I say things like self-management is the only thing that scales, not your framework. Uh, Mr. Snowden talked about not having an end goal in mind, but rather going towards the adjacent possible, you know, the one-off thing that we can do today so we get more of this and less of that. Um, hey, guess what? In the Agile community today, what actually gets sold is an APC prescription towards a goal. Um, when a certain framework vendor, who will not be named, uh, was asked, why is the framework this way? Uh, he replied, it's, it's what the people wanted. Um, that seems to discount what they needed, in my opinion. So let's get into this. Can you turn the slide one? No, you just go like the right arrow. That's all you have to do. Just one, yeah. So this is what we're going to cover, right? So we're going to cover... Authority distribution, the triggering nature of authority distribution. We'll cover agreements, uh, that is the lack of agreements that we have in our organizations today about transformation. Uh, we'll talk if about I get of your attention, please, presentations the in the breakout rooms have begun now. So if you haven't already, please feel free and, um, to make your way into those rooms. Oh, also, uh, feel free to bring your refreshments and with you. And I want to talk you. about uh, modern management, uh, uh, namely self-management, which is actually the only kind of management that matters today. And then the last thing I'd like to speak with you with is something called inviting leadership, arguably the most important leadership skill of the 21st century. So um, this session promises three big things. I'll also deliver those three big things. Um, is that fair? All right, so let's proceed. Uh, next slide. Okay, so who am I? I have 10,000 hours of coaching, and I wrote two books, and I have these clients. Next slide. <clears throat> And since 2001, I've been involved in over 40 attempts at agile transformation at various states of maturity. 
um, what I've commonly find is that we don't get transformation, we get transformations. That is a zombie-like state where people go into unconscious triggered behavior. Okay? All right. So if you want to really read more about my heresies, um, there's 50 or 60 of those that are free to the world. You can Google Agile Coaching Lessons where you can um, see me where I've recited to the world my Agile Coaching Heresies. Okay? All right, next slide. All right, there, here we go. Anybody have any questions what we're about to do here? Uh, there is one thing. There's going to be some uh, exercises, some I interactions with people next to you. You won't have to get out of your seat or anything like that, okay? You won't have to touch them. They won't kiss you or hug you unless you want them to. Okay, so here's the Agile thing. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And then uh, build projects around motivated people. Give them the environment and support they need. And trust them to get the job done. And then there's another one about... The best of everything comes from self-organizing teams, right? So self-organizing teams, motivated people, individuals. Um, I think we fail miserably in this regard. Let, let's get into it. Let, keep this slide uh, right, right here because I'm going to talk on it. No, no, yeah, go, go forward one and then stay there. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. When you bring Agile into your company, you are going to change the way authority is distributed, and that's going to trigger everyone the managers, the architects, the executives, and the team members. The managers will be triggered because they find out that self-management is actually what Agile is supposed to be all about, and they kind of wonder where they are. If you're in an organization that values people over the roles they occupy, you probably don't need any agility because you probably are agility. Most companies value role over person, so this is very triggering for people when they find out what's about to happen. Okay, can we go back one slide? Yeah. How come it's moving like that? What's the story with that? Can you go back one? Can you go back one more? Okay, that's good. Managers are triggered. Architects are triggered because now they're no longer going to have architect. They read the scrum guide and it says everyone in a team is, has a title of developer. There's a symbolic reason for that. Everyone has equal authority in a scrum team, at least in the beginning and at least in theory. Executives are also triggered. I don't know if you realize this, but just because your CEO wants Agile doesn't mean that his or her staff does. And there's people in that organization that are going to work to undermine the change. Why? because they're going to lose standing, they're going to lose position, and the way authority is distributed is going to change. And there's going to be people that are invested in the current status quo that like things just the way they are. And of course, teams and team members will also be triggered. And one of the reasons why is because they're accustomed to doing things in, in this ordered way. They're accustomed to being told what to do. If you work for a brokerage firm, an insurance company, a bank, or a government contractor, you know, you, you took that job because things were ordered there. And now there's all this disorder coming with agility, and I'm expected to make decisions and then be held accountable to them. And that's, you know, I don't know if I really like that. And oh, by the way, I've been here during the re-engineering stuff and the Six Sigma stuff. Been here 20 years now, so. Let's just give it a little time. <laughs> Next slide. So the way authority, we're going to mention the A word now, authority. The way authority is distributed is going to change. And if you've played well and become a manager, a leader, an architect, or an executive, you are not happy with changes in authority distribution, especially the type that Agile bring. Can you see why? So there's all this baked in resistance to the very thing we all say we actually want. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so let's consider Scrum. Scrum is actually a schema for distributing authority. It's an authority game. And we could say that this is a very triggering game because it's doing the thing that's, you know, we're not happy about, which is moving authority around. Everyone um, is triggered, including the team members, who previously had less authority, now they have more. That's triggering because, like, how do I handle that? That's not really what I signed up for, nobody asked me, that kind of thing. Uh, the next one, thank you very much for turning these. So now, an exercise, I want you to find someone. I want you, how many people here are doing Scrum? How many people here are managers or architects or executives of some kind? Okay, how many people here work on software teams? All right, and how many folks have been doing some kind of Agile for more than one year? Okay, so this is perfect. Find someone and um, describe to them an impediment in your company and then do your best to identify the authority dimension that's at the root of it all 
and then sw- then take turns. Like just two minutes. Go do that two minutes each. Go ahead. or something? Yeah, I'll, I'll do a five minutes. So we have a half minutes. hour. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Were they moving on their own? They are. <laughs> so what, like, what the hell? It was me. So it's like, okay, I can't even hover my finger over the button, but I actually had my finger on the metal surface, not the button, and the slide move, and it happened twice. And said, so I can't even touch yeah, the machine I, at all. Yeah, that happened to me too. <laughs> so I can't even touch the machine at all until the time the button. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, well, the clock's right there. I just, but, but because, uh, what I want to do is I make sure I get all the content and I don't want to rush at the end. I'd rather leave a little margin at the end and um, take yeah. questions right. than to, uh, so I'm going to bias towards going faster yeah. instead yeah. of slower. Yeah. Most people don't really want to talk about the security stuff, but it's actually all the other Undermining the uh, Of course, but wait till we get shake, you're shaking the pecking order. <laughs> yeah, but wait till we get to the next slide, which is like it's just completely unreasonable to bring in a game changing authority distribution scheme or scrub and not ask people if they agree. It's it's actually nonsense to do this. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Okay, just one more minute then, because we'll kind of wrap it up and get to the end. Sometimes I try to talk people out of that, and if they don't think they're ready for it, I'll say, you know, you've got to understand, uh, yes, the user is going to have the control of what, but the workforce is going to have control of when. That's it. If you're not willing to do that. Exactly. <laughs> think, will you keep turning them for me? Oh, yeah. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. All right. So, can I get your attention? It's, it's fun to talk about authority and how we re- regularly uh, do boundary violations in the authority department. So did anybody have an impediment that did not have an authority dimension? Show of hands. He, an, anyone have an impediment that not, do not have a serious authority dimension? Okay, so isn't that interesting? So that's your number one takeaway. I want you to focus on authority distribution and how it's triggering everyone who's resisting. Okay? Okay, now let's go to the next step. Here's a summary. Redistributing authority is difficult. People are deeply invested in the current schema. And if you do not change the schema, your transformation is dead on arrival. It just ain't going to happen. Because guess what? The definition of transformation is a refactoring of the way authority is distributed in your company. That's the reality of it all. So I want you to take that home and really think about it over the next couple days and when you go back to work next week. Okay, next slide. Okay, now let's look at Scrum. Scrum has a set of agreements about how authorities distributed. There's three roles in Scrum. They have authorized tasks and there's certain rules, like only the product owner can prioritize the backlog. Daily Scrum belongs to the team. Only the team's authorized to say how much goes in the sprint, right? These are all authority distribution rules. So I have a question for you. <clears throat> when did you agree When did you agree in your company to be subject to these rules as a stakeholder, as a manager, as a team member, or as someone else who occupies a scrum role? When did you agree? Answer? I was told. Thank you, sir. I brought, I brought, sir, I did see the the, the crowd with certain, uh, you know, favorable people that would ask, you know, give answers like that. No, actually, you were told. So is it any wonder that you resist when you're told to play a game that you don't like? Has anyone here ever been told to play a game they were unwilling to play, like, like from a little kid? Like a little kid, they use guilt and stuff to get you to play, right? Well, in work, we're not even, we're not even consulted on something that affects every aspect of our working lives. Is it any wonder the scrum doesn't work? 
So let's go to the next slide. All right, so most problems with Scrum are problems with authority distribution, as we just learned. Um, this is, uh, looks like a repeat slide. We'll go, go ahead one. So here's the next one. I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them the story of when you examine the Scrum Guide in detail. You know, the rules of the game. It says the definitive rules of the game on the subtext. You know the one. And explain to them when you explicitly agreed to play the game. Take turns. Take a couple minutes. Go ahead. It's funny, isn't it? Nobody agrees. We were never asked. You're a good sport. I appreciate. I appreciate you. Oh, look! It went again. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, get your body. You have to get your body away. You probably, you probably have a, a some kind of energy field or something. All right, another minute, so then, and then we're done. <clears throat> okay, can I get your attention now? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so can anyone remember when they agreed? How many people remember when they agreed? Take a look around, everyone. How many people remember when they explicitly agreed? One, two, three, four, five. There's a definite maybe six. Six, can I get seven? Seven going once. Seven going twice. Okay, so out of, I don't know, 60 of us, 70 of us, like 10% of us remember agreeing. The rest of us even never agreed or don't remember agreeing. Isn't that interesting? So is it any wonder that your scrum game at work is a like more messed up than last Thanksgiving's turkey. Okay, can we uh, go one slide and forward? Okay, so empiricism is actually a philosophy that says the best kind of learning is through direct experience, okay? And it's at the root of good agility, it's at the root of experimentation. So experimentation is pretty darn important. It's learning by experience, empiricism. In other words, we're not gonna pretend that we know all the answers. We're going to be okay not knowing what all the answers are. There's a certain amount of tension that's involved in not knowing, especially with engineers who get paid for knowing. I have a computer science degree. One of the reasons why I have one is because I love the sense of control that it gives me, where I can create my own little universe and I can be the judge, jury, and executioner. Do you understand what I'm talking about? It's a one or a zero, right? It's not this vague, you know, uh, nonsense that, you know, with people. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, next one. Okay, the process of changing is best framed as an experiment. If it's not framed as an experiment, it's framed as a forced march, right? And how, how, how welcoming is that? How inviting is that? Can any self-management occur if it's a forced march? So it's an experiment to be inspected. Hey, we have to go back. Yeah, it's an experiment to be inspected. If it's not framed that way, you're going to have a whole bunch of people that are just going to be crossing their arms and tapping their toes and looking at their watch and going, I'm just going to give it a little time. I'm going to limp along with the rest of these people. And this is going to go away just like every other thing ever did. It's funny, you're laughing because it's so funny, right? If you just wait it out, eventually it will die. Right? Isn't it true? Okay, so one slide ahead, only one. Ask yourself, is the implementation of practices at my company an experiment to be inspected, or is it a forced death march until further notice? I want you to find someone and, 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 and tell them what it is at your company. Go ahead, just spend a minute doing that, each of you, and then take turns, go ahead.
I'm glad you're here. It must be programmed into the into the, the into the uh, PowerPoint or something. It, it's a little clock. When it ticks down, does it over? What? Oh, static or something. Oh, some physical stuff. Yeah. Now, this one's really important. I'm not going to rush them. Because all these agile adoptions are forced marches. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do you well, get it? Actually, so I think they're not all. Yeah, yeah. All right, so can we, uh, can I get your attention? All right. So for how many people is the whole adoption in your company, authority in your company, you know, the formally authorized leaders, the ones who get their, their authority from the board? How many, how many uh, co people work in companies where the formally authorized leaders are framing the whole thing as an experiment to be inspected? Show of hands. There's a one, there's a two, there's a three, four, four, a definite, uh, a definite four, four, sort of four, okay, five, 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 going once, okay, five out of six, 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 do we have a seven, seven, all right, all right, so seven, again, seven out of 65 or so, this is deplorable, and that does, that's not meant to, tr that's not meant to trigger you, by the way, <clears throat> this is, what's another word for deplorable? It sucks, what else? Sad. Now that's another trigger phrase. Oh, should be. Okay, so that's a neck. Okay, so we need to take one away. Okay, so, so what, what am I getting at? The whole thing about agility is about experimentation and empiricism and, and learning one off and going again. The adjacent possible, as David was taught us, right? What's the adjacent possible is the question to be asking. Okay. We're not doing that, so are we really surprised? Are we surprised? Do you have a question? Right. Yeah, yeah, the pilot. The pilot team is actually, there's something really, really beautiful about a, one characteristic of the pilot teams. We're going to get into it in a second. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so self, let's talk about part four, self-management. Self-management, you know, we talk about the best of everything comes from self-organizing teams. Stop right there. Flocks of birds are self-organizing. Schools of fishes are self-organizing. Mobs, mobs of humans are self-organizing. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is people in teams working in goal-driven organizations that are trying to maximize profit and reduce waste, right? Okay. So in that context, self-organization is self-management. Social systems, self-organization is self-management, okay? Self-management is largely the management of decision-making. So what are you managing? You're managing the decision-making process. I want you to just think about that for a minute. Self-management is the management of decision-making. Now, if teams aren't making any decisions, dot, 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 Right? Okay. Now here's the other thing. Self-managed teams know how they make decisions. On Monday, I want you to go around your company and go to a team and ask two or three of the team members, how do you make decisions in your team? And listen very carefully to what they say. And if they give you an incoherent answer, then you know that they're not self-managed. If on the other hand you listen and they have a coherent, consistent response to that question across different individuals, you know they've inspected, explored, and unpacked, and um, explicitly agreed to how they make decisions. You have a question in the back. Uh, so what do you mean to say in, in a self-organized That's a really difficult thing to do. <laughs> I don't know how you would do that myself. 
And I want to say something about management. Management is as important as ever. And here's the quote for you, okay? It's a function, not a role. Management is as important as ever. It's not embodied in one person anymore. It's a function of the group. It's not a role. Self-management. It boils down to decision-making. If teams are not making decisions, they cannot be self-managed because there's no decisions to manage. Do you understand? So think about that when you go back to work. And decision-making triggers a, a lot of engagement. When I have to decide, I'm engaged. Even in this, even in this conference, when you look at the, the things you could have done in this hour, you chose this. You had to decide. That was an engaging moment for you. You were deeply engaged in the conference by choosing, by deciding. See that? You manage, you self-manage yourself all the way into this room. When you were doing that, you were deeply engaged. What am I going to go to? You're deeply engaged in the conference. Okay, next, next slide. So engagement is the whole thing. I want you to go back to work, and I want you to answer the question, how can we engage the people here in a deeper way in the things that really matter to this company. Because if you get that done, all your Agile stuff's gonna go great. Because right now, the reason why your Agile stuff isn't working is because there's very high levels of disengagement. Okay? I, uh, go back one slide. I know you didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> I want you to consider this. How many people here convene meetings? Everyone, okay, I want you to discuss why or why not you could make a meeting optional for all participants next week. I want you to notice that, <laughs> you're laughing out loud because it's so funny, isn't it? Do you, how many people here use Outlook? Everyone, yeah. Outlook, when you schedule a meeting and you go to the participants, it's called a what? An invitation. But they have to go, don't they? Okay. I want, you to <laughs> I want you to discuss why or why not you could make a meeting optional next week in your company. You don't need any more authorization than you already have. You own that meeting. You don't need, you don't need budget. You, it's, you're already there. There's nothing to buy. Why couldn't you do that? On the theory that putting people on a decision engages them. Just Discuss that for two minutes with each other. What, what's between you and making a meeting optional next week? What would it be like in the culture of your company? What would people think if you told them they didn't have to come to a meeting? Go ahead. Give it a try. was one of those coaches and she said today we're going to have the law of two feet oh yeah that's open space yeah and everybody looked at her like what are you talking about you don't have to go well you can go to any group you want or you can go stand by yourself yeah but form you know she'd give an exercise like go put yourself in a group and if you find you're not in the right group go, go to, to another one. one that's open space that's where i'm going with this whole conversation okay can i have your, your attention please Okay, so we're going to speed up a little bit because I want to make up. Uh, I want to make room for questions and everything. Um, optional meetings uh, require an invitation, and they have to. It has to be okay for them to opt out. And if they opt out, a real in a real invitation, you don't chase them. You don't ask them why. Now, many people opt out for many, many reasons for to an invitation, but they only opt in for one reason, and that's because the 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 invitation was attractive to them. Okay. So 
think about that when you try to make your meetings optional. I promise you it will be a thrilling exploration into empirical learning. If you will just make one meeting optional. If you're not willing, I want you to consider making some real inconsequential meeting that's on Friday afternoon optional, okay? Okay, next slide. Okay, so engagement's the whole show. Invitation triggers decision making in inviting leaders in ma manifest epic levels of self-management through inviting people because you're putting them on a decision. Do you understand? And deci deciding is very engaging. If I'm not deciding, I can't, why should I engage at all? I can just zone out. Everyone's zoned out at meetings. I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands on that because all the hands will go up. Every one of us has zoned out in meetings. Our bodies are there and we're off someplace else. Okay? All right, next slide. So here's the things. Three things to do. There's actually four. I'm summing up now. Here's what I want you to do. In your Agile adoption, I want you to go to the leaders, the formally authorized executive leaders who get their authority from the board or people who get their authority from the board, and I want you to ask them to go first with this Agile stuff. I want them to do their leadership work in an Agile way, so I want them to have a backlog. I want them to have a daily meeting. I know, it's funny, isn't it? And, and here's, the, here's the funniest part. I want them to demo their progress at the end of the one-month sprint in front of the whole tribe that reports to them. Okay? That's what I want you to propose. When you do this, several very interesting things will trigger across the entire socioplex. Okay? Until the leaders go first, it's just all bullshit. Okay? That's all I have to say about that. Next, I want the executive leaders to phrase the entire Agile experience in the company as a series of time-boxed experiments, enterprise-wide iterations to be inspected. And when we inspect those things, we are going to drop things that aren't working like a bad habit. And we're going to keep doing things that are working, and we're going to try new things that might work. And that's the message that I want the leaders to send. So this falls under the heading of leadership signaling. Leaders are signaling devices in the social system. The same way we use signs and signage and signals to get home when we drive, we use signals and signage in the social systems in which we have membership. And guess whose signals are the most important? The authority figures. So I want them to signal well. I want them to go first, and I want them to tell generative, life-giving stories about how the whole thing is one big experiment, because that's at the root of any good Agile anyway. So why not just eat our own dog food from the top to the bottom, okay? That's number two. Thank you, that was very intuitive. Thing three. I want the executive leaders not just to signal it, I want them to do it. I want them to identify the willing people, you know, the ones who are like possible, adjacently possible to like tip this thing right here, right now, to be the new champions, right? And I want to work with the willing people. So how would this work out? You schedule training. The training can hold uh, 40 people. Hey, guess what? The first four teams that signal that they want this training are going to get it, and then that section is closed. Now you only have willing people in the training. Willing people drive everything. Unwilling people don't. The fourth, oh, go back one slide. Uh, go back one more. Did I do three already? Just checking. Yeah, we did. Okay, four. This one right here. I want the leaders to start and stop enterprise-wide iterations, not on the product, but on the process of changing. Not on the product we're producing, the process of changing. What's working? What's not working? What do we want to change? And I want the whole tribe in that room, I want it to be an all-hands meeting. Ideally, I want it to be an open space meeting. Next slide. Okay, so, enterprise-wide iteration and inspection. Nobody's doing this today. 
No, nobody's getting the whole organization in one room to answer the question, how's our Agile adoption going? That ain't happening. But it could happen in our lifetime. You could start on Monday. Here's all the things we can do. We can reduce the cost. We can manage risk. You know how much these Agile adoptions cost? How many people work for a company with thousands of employees? Lots of people. Okay. So your Agile adoption is going to be costing north of $500,000, $600,000 for training and coaching. Could be a million dollars. Gee, don't you want to know how many willing people you have before you just sprinkle gasoline on the money and flick a match on it like that? Okay, so we're going to save costs. We're also going to reduce the risk of just torching money like that. We're going to tap into the collective intelligence of the tribe, and we're going to get everyone engaged in the process of changing. They're going to be characters in the story, in an emerging story. They are also, some of them are going to show up as emergent leaders. They're going to be authors of the new story, co-authors of the new story. Your leaders have everything to do with making this happen. This is what's going to give you a legitimate transformation. Okay, next slide. So, Open space meeting format, it's a great way to have an all-hands meeting. Let's take a look. Next slide. This is how it starts. Everyone sits in a circle. There's a theme. There's no agenda. We create an agenda dynamically on the fly. Authority greets you after they've invited you, and you don't have to come to the meeting. Authority sits down after they introduce the facilitator. The facilitator takes us through a process of getting the agenda built, and then as soon as possible, the facilitator gets out of the way. Oh, by the way, it's really important for that facilitator to not be from your tribe. Can you see why? Say I'm coaching you and I'm there a month. I've done training and I'm coaching teams. I'm already in your tribe. Now it becomes the Dan show. Do you understand? Can you see that? So I want you to go get someone from somewhere else and have them come in and do the facilitation. Okay, next slide. Here's what the agenda looks like after it's built on the wall. The uh, A, B, C, and D are spaces. The times are rows. The intersection of a time and a space is a session. Those are all dynamic. Next slide. This is small sessions and what they look like. People get together. Sometimes they sit in a circle and have a conversation. Other times they have a sort of instructor-led thing. Somebody holds up a session and says, hey, I want to teach about self-management. Anybody who wants to really know about it and how to do it, come and see me, and I'm going to, I'm going to give a little, a, little, a little teaching on that. This is another side. And here's the proceedings. This is proceedings generation. Do not even have the open space meeting if you don't pr produce a physical proceedings document that becomes the basis for action and exploration going forward. Okay, and then the next slide. This is a closing circle. It ends in a circle. So there's convergence in the circle, then there's divergence in the small sessions, and then there's convergence again at the end. Okay, next slide. And that's what it is. It's a purely invitational meeting. Next slide. And this is a framework that uses open spaces to frame the beginning and ending of an enterprise-wide iteration of experimentation with agile practices, which will be inspected in the second open space. This is your installer. So when authority stands up in the first open space meeting, that green big dot on the, on the left there, whoop, you have to go back one, and they say, look, we're going to, this is important work. Yeah, there's food and it's fun, but this is work. We want those proceedings. We're going to act on them with you, and we're going we're to work with SAFE, or we're going to work with LESS, we're going to work with Agile Practices, or whatever it is, and we're going to inspect this again in 100 days so you can have at it in 100 days. And we're going to have a referendum in 100 days on what's working, what's not working. So suspend your disbelief, act as if, and pretend that what we're about to do in the next 100 days could actually work. And if it doesn't, you're going to get a hearing in 100 days. So if you like this meeting, you're going to love the one 100 days from now. Have a great day in our open space. Okay, that's what it's all about. This is described outside where I have a little table, and you can come up and talk more about this. This is your installer, because here's, here's the story. Your framework doesn't scale. Your framework doesn't scale. Self-management's what scales. This generates tremendous amounts of self-management. This is your ticket out of chaos. Okay? Next slide. You sign up for my list at danielmezik.com. The whole thing, Open Space Agility, is described in this book. I'll send you the Kindle edition of the book with my compliments. You don't need a Kindle to read it. You can install a Kindle on any reader on any Mac or any PC. 
And uh, you can have that with my compliments if you sign up for my list by Saturday night at the stroke of 12. Oh, something went terribly wrong. That was so sudden. Can you just put up the last slide? All right, so now we have 10 minutes. I just want to take questions. Questions for 10 minutes. We have, we have a microphone somewhere. We're just going to walk around and just go ahead. Here's the microphone guy right here. Josh. Oh, I just had a question around the open space agility, um, kicking it off with your executive leadership and then following it through. Um, creating open space dialogue where the previous paradigm or the current state is not feeling open space to a lot of uh, the participants. How do you break through that? How do you break through that? Yeah, so here's how you break through it. Here's, here's, if you could just go to the last slide, that'll be good. Um, here's the story. When you do open spaces with, with, that are, uh, span 100 days apart, it's actually 100 days of open, the spirit of open space. Because people realize there's another meeting coming, so it takes all the air out of their anxieties because they go, you know, that meeting was really interesting. I was able to do whatever I wanted. I said whatever I wanted. I did whatever I wanted. I, it was great. I can't wait for the next one. So what people do is they suspend their disbelief, and it's part of the adjacent possible. We want to, look, let me just bottom line this. Is it a legitimate culture change to just get rid of all the people who disagree and get new people? Is that a legitimate culture change? Yeah, just, you don't have to worry about that. It's all, it's all cool. Just go up to slideshow, run slide. Yeah, slideshow, slideshow, run slide. Yeah. Is it legitimate or not? Can we just replace everyone? Is that, what we, is that the world you want to live in? Is that the world you want to manage or be part of, be managed by? It's not the one I want to live in. So why, what are we doing to convert the, tolerate, the resistors to tolerators? What are we doing to create, to convert the uh, tolerators to supporters? This is your way out. Who's got another question? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I actually have. Um, but here's the other thing. When they say no, they do change their mind. So they might not be willing to go all the way with open space. So here's some things you can do. You can drop the executives themselves into an open space about the Agile Manifesto. And if you come over to the booth, I'll tell you how to do that. I call it the A1 meeting. You teach them something about the manifesto. They, they do a little exercise. Then they take a break. When they come back, the chairs are in a circle. And there's a theme on the wall, Agile, do we want to do this in service to what? And then you walk them through it. You never say the O word, not even one time. Don't do it. And then afterwards, when they're passing the microphone around, they're like, wow, that meeting was really interesting. And then you say to them, yeah, that's called open space. That's what we want to do. A lot of times they won't want to do uh, any open space at all. In that case, in that case, you, you just have no choice. You have to try something else, like have them make a meeting optional or ask them to go first or something like that. It, this is an incremental thing. Going back to the question about, you know, how do we actually do this in a culture that doesn't support this idea? You might not get the executive to do it. But you know what? I don't know any other way to get a legitimate agile adoption, one that's lasting. So let's define, let's be really clear about this. What's success? Success is all the KPIs you are measuring, all the key performance indicators that you're measuring are higher than they were a year ago after the coaches left. That's our definition of success. Talk to any coach in the world and give them that definition and ask them what percentage of Agile adoptions actually stick, and they're going to tell you 15%. That's one in about six. In other words, you're a five-to-one dog against. It's a terrible bet. It's awful. It's, it's, dege it's degenerate gambling at, at deplorable odds, an extremely high bet size. In other words, it's pathetic. Work with the willing people. Leaders go first. Phrase everything as an experiment. Then inspect the experiment. Create all hands meetings and get everyone in one room and tap the collective intelligence of the tribe in how to solve these problems. 
and then use your authorization to solve them. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to implement Agile in an Agile way. I want, I want you to notice something. When we show up and push Agile, think about Kanban. The, the team pulls the work into the Kanban, right? Think about Scrum. The team pulls the work into the sprint. Oh, yeah, pull's really good. Pull is great. Pull is full of virtue. F pull is full of love. Pull is beautiful until we implement Agile. Then only push can work. Push, push, push. First we do assessment, then we do training, then we do coaching, then we, then we, then we. Until the budget runs out, then the coaches leave. Now what do you've got? You got nothing, here's why. Your authoritative style and when you're coaching and when you're leading kills self-organization. Why? Because you're making all the decisions and the people that are following you are not. And so is it any wonder when the highly authoritative coaches leave after the budget runs out that there's nothing left? There's no budget, there's no self-management. All there is is broken promises, resentment, and disengagement. And then the person who said, let's just give it a little time, they look pretty smart. So what are we doing to improve that? Who else has a question? Can you, can you say more about the optional meetings? Because I'm like picturing Scrum and if Everybody doesn't come. Oh, let's talk about this for a minute. <laughs> First of all, no one agreed to Scrum. Okay, thank so isn't any surprise that the daily Scrums are bad? Isn't any surprise that your sprint planning is, is, is you know, just the death, you know, it's just, it's just the most awful thing you've ever seen. Uh, you know, nobody agreed. You've got to get agreements first. Without agreements, you have nothing. So I want everyone to read the Scrum Guide. I want them to um, signal their agreement or not. And if they can't agree, I want the executives to ask them the question of the leaders. What will it take to get you in? Here's what usually works. Reduce the ask size from until further notice to how about six months? And if they say no, then I want you to reduce the ask by half and go again. So say how about for three months? Okay, and they say no. Well, how about for a month and a half? Now it's getting ridiculous, isn't it? Okay, so this in general is a very strong technique. Walk around and put people on decisions. Invite them to do things with you, to go somewhere or to do something. That's the definition of an invitation, to, to make an offer, to go somewhere or do something. And when they say no, reduce the ask by half. Now, you know, the girl I'm married to for 36 years now, did not want anything to do with me. And I just kept asking, and I kept asking for less. All right, who else has a question? It's the first time I've heard the notion of using Agile for non-software development projects when you said get the managers to do it. So can you just talk about that? I mean, I thought... Yeah, let's get, let's, get real, let's get real about this. The pace of change driven by technology is putting tremendous pressure on businesses to adapt or die, okay? And the companies that are getting this right are exploiting new markets that have increasingly short half-lives. So the, the, the most adaptive company wins. Do you understand? Okay, so this has to do with organizational learning. This is what Agile is about, organizational learning. So if your organization learns faster than your competitors, you eat their lunch. You thrive and they don't. The, the opportunity durations are shorter and shorter. The cycles are shorter and shorter. The pace of change is faster and faster. Everyone across the whole organization has to be involved in learning. And that's not going to happen unless you intend it as an organization. So here's the deal. Organizational learning doesn't happen unless it's intended. Software turns out to be a laboratory where we're learning how to do organizational learning because software refuses to ship. Did you ever notice that? It's a one or a zero. If it's not perfect, it doesn't ship. The quality's low. It's, it's a, if, it's, if it's bad, it's a perfect reflection of your bad interactions. Software development as a delivery environment is the harshest learning lab ever constructed about teamwork. We, now these lessons are coming up and out of software, 
So we can use it in marketing, we can use it in leadership, we can use it in finance across all the teams, and we darn well better in all the people who are stakeholders to the software function in your company had better be at that open space meeting or they're going to miss the show. Because we all need to get in one room and mix our perspectives. This is what Mr. Snowden talked about, right? The ones who saw the gorilla and the ones who didn't. They need to have a conversation, don't they? Open space is a tremendous place for, to say, I saw the gorilla, did you guys see it? And they're like, what are you talking about? And then one of the 18% says, yeah, I saw it too. And the other people that didn't see it are like, these people are, you know, as soft as grapes. And what gorilla, you know? But in open space, this all comes out and comes out in a very respectful way. So um, there's not a lot of ways to botch open space. That's why I love the format. Who else has a question? We're, I think we're out of time. We only have two more minutes. So how about one more question, two more questions? Are we good? Okay, yes. As often as your company has issues that they're trying to resolve in, the, in, in, in pursuit of continuous improvement in organizational learning. So I like to have an open space meeting in January after the holidays and in June before the vacation time. And there's always something to work on. So a couple months before the meeting, you call people together, cross-section of the authority levels across the organization to come in and create a theme for the meeting. And then that theme becomes the sort of container for the invitation that authority sends out. And oh, by the way, if authority doesn't send out the invite, don't even have the meeting because it doesn't mean anything. Because what matters is what authority says. Okay, so there's a fellow named uh, Jamshid Garajadagi. He wrote a book called Systems Thinking. He's a fellow who's an acolyte of Russell Ackoff. He says that social systems are information bonded, right? So some things are chemically bonded, some things are physically bonded. Social systems are information bonded. Okay, so what's the content of the information that creates the binding? Here it is. It's the authority distribution information. That's what binds us. Like right now, we're in the last two minutes of the session, but you guys came in here and you authorized me with your presence to teach you something. Do you see how there's a binding there? Right? Same exact thing in your company. What's the formal distribution schema? Like Mr. Snowden said, what's the... He called it the real, the real, uh, the real thing and the authentic thing. Like, uh, you know, the informal was, the, you know, the informal and the formal. There's what's on the org chart, but we all know there's a story behind the story that runs the company that's not on the org chart, right? Yeah, that's all part of the authority distribution schema. It's what binds us. So one more question and then we need to deconvene. Yes, yes, and yes. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for saying that. I, I want to leave you with one thing, okay? When you invite people, like I said, there's many reasons why they won't come to your meeting, but there's only one reason why they do, and that's because they like the invitation. And if they like the invitation, it's because you gave a clear goal, you had a clear set of rules, you described how we would track progress through this meeting by time and by task, and you ask them to come and play at your meeting. It was opt-in participation. So when this all happens, here's what shows up. The passionate and the responsible. Without passion, nobody cares. And without responsibility, nothing gets done. Now when the passionate and responsible people show up, people care and things get done. And that's my lesson to you today regarding opt-in meetings. We're out of time. I'm going to go out there by my booth and you can hang with me out there and ask me any question you want. Get on my list and get the book for free. Thank you very much. <laughs>